Cheers. Welcome back. Now, well, let's talk a bit of education, a bit, because we can't really cover it all. Universal access to education has been a prime target for Nigeria over the years, and the country is committed at, to providing basic education to all citizens. You hear government talk about that a great deal. In 2008, the federal government, through the Nigerian Educational Research and Development Council, developed the nine-year basic education curriculum in schools by realigning all extant primary and junior secondary schools curriculum to meet the target of UBE. In 2012, the nine-year basic education curriculum was revised and its implementation kicked start, kick started in 2014. Question is, how well have we improved on this so far? How effective has that curriculum been? And then, I don't know, still find them not being able to spell simple words. Not Basic. being able to construct simple English sentences. And that shows up at the university tertiary level. OK, anyway, so um, to help us look at all of this, we have in the studio Annie Basieyo, who's an education specialist. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. He actually trains teachers, he says. <laughs> and Taiwo Salau, member Education Reformers Innovation Team. My name is actually Aditola Salau. Aditola Salau. Sorry about that. OK, Aditola, so let me start with you. That question, so how well would you say this revision, which kick-started in 2012, it was done, the nine-year basic education thing, then it kick-started in 2014. But how effective would you say it's been? Well, we have a major issue when it comes to implementing policies in Nigeria. It always comes down to execution. Our execution has not been great. And Annie and I were actually having a discussion while we are waiting. And I said a huge part of the reform that we need to embark on here in the curriculum space has to do with moving away from our curriculum being focused on just our subject, but being focused on what the learner needs. It needs to be learner-centered. There are three forms of curriculum, and one of them is subject-based. The other one is learner-centered. The other one is problem-centered. We need to really focus on what the learner needs. You see in a lot of the countries that where they perform very well on the PISA test, those their curriculum is really learner-centered and is really focused on what the learners will need when they come out in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And that's what mm -hmm. our team, the Education in a Reformation Innovation team, we're working on. Okay. I'm sure your research has also uh, told you um, what subjects would form what you classify as learner-focused. Oh, yes. What subjects are those, please? I'm a learning scientist, actually, <laughs> and I'm really focused on learning, research around learning. And I wouldn't really say subject. I mm -hmm. would say areas. OK, areas. And there are six areas that we have um, seen, collaboration, critical thinking, let's see, communication, compassion, my, the two. They'll, they'll come, as I'm remembering them. They'll come, I'll recall okay. them. But th these areas have to do with how, OK, yes, um, being global citizens, and the other one will come. <laughs> OK, <laughs> yes. okay. And, um, let's switch yes. to Annie in the, yes, meantime, the meantime, while yes. you search for that one. <laughs> yeah. um, Annie, you said to us before we went on air that you train teachers. Yes. So not, um, not me particularly. Yeah, I mean, you have yeah. an institution. Well, you yeah. have a, yeah. a concern that does that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a very strange kind of business to go into <laughs> because we have colleges of education mm. all over the country. Mm. Why did you opt to do this? Okay, so um, my previous background, I used to be an investment banker, um, I'm a chartered accountant and <laughs> a finance person, but we still need to teach, don't we? Life is a long life learning um, process. So in 2009, um, when we had the really bad network results, my co-founder and I, looked at the Nigerian education value chain and we realized that one of the areas where there were issues was actually the teacher. And it wasn't just the teacher in the sense of those that are um, out of service or uh, pre-service that go through the colleges of education, but the ones that were in service. Mm -hmm. um, and the performance we saw there was quite, uh, there was a huge conundrum, there were issues of, um, um, you know, quality of the teachers actually at the center of the training. So we did a lot of research and found out that it was mainly the government that was providing some sort of 
continuous professional development, largely through what you call the National Teachers Institute, Kaduna. And um, we set up a pri this private concern back in 2010. And between 2010 and now, um, luckily enough, we've been able to train about 20,000 teachers on continuous professional development and e-content to about a quarter of a million Nigerian teachers. The teacher is central to curriculum. Definitely. And um, we need to understand that the curriculum is really an instrument to achieve learning outcomes for citizens of a particular um, country or a particular society or a particular homogeneous group in the future. And in this context of Nigeria, it's not just about creating a curriculum, but also enabling the key stakeholders of the curriculum to implement it. So. Um, I hope I've answered your question why I went into yes, um, training teachers. <laughs> um, it's the important aspect of the value chain uh -huh. and then they're an important ingredient and, and therefore we need to kind of um, ensure that um, we provide the services that enable that to That's continue. Right. Okay, yeah. staying with you, I'm looking at the nine-year BEC as a basic education mm. curriculum and the basic features, uh, core subjects, electives and there's just one elective subject which is optional um, then there's another foreign language pre-vocational studies and then basic science and technology religion national values and pre-vocational studies as composite subjects the question is the features of this n the of the nine-year BEC do you think the role of the teacher was considered in all of this. I'll still come back to that learning curriculum. Oh, yeah. Right. But let me, let me finish mm -hmm. with him as regards the teacher and this BEC. You know, it doesn't matter how bad a curriculum is. A teacher, a good teacher, can implement and step down in a curriculum if they have the basics. When I meet a minister or a commissioner of education or a key stakeholder, what I often tell them is that it's not about those beautiful schools or laboratories. You have teachers in Kenya teaching under a tree, and the learning outcomes are far better than a lot of top-range private schools. So the teacher is an essential ingredient in that whole, in that whole, in that whole process. Um, so I don't want to be so semantic about the, the issues of the BEC, the current curriculum. I believe that if a teacher is provided with a skill set, they should be able to implement that curriculum to some extent. However, the larger problem we have with our curriculum, it's not even about um, the teachers, I think. The biggest problem is we're trying to create a curriculum in a vacuum. The visioning is what is the m missing ingredient. What are we really training for? Are we training for a Nigeria of 2030, a Nigeria of 2050? Have we um, imagined what Nigeria will be in 2050. Because you need to kind of have that leadership and that whole visioning. And that, that's not something that happens at the family level. It's not something that isn't happening at the ministry level. It's something that happens through a, a very robust and high level economic planning team through the highest level of governance, you know, through the judiciary, through the Senate, through the executive, to kind of help us as a country imagine and vision where we're going to. Mm. When we know where we're going to, then we can build a curriculum. So for instance, if Nigeria is going to become a center of ICT in 2050, then our curriculum will be skewed towards STEM, mm -hmm. and even the vocational track will ensure that people who drop out of JS3 can go into coding, can go into social blogging, etc. I was telling someone the other day that one of our competitive ad, um, advantages in Nigeria is branding. A, the average Nigeria may not have a substance, but by the time you see him or her and their business, it, they are well branded. So maybe that's a whole uh, business. We could end up being brand entrepreneurs for the world. Mm. So if we don't look at what are we really planning for, for Nigeria, what is the Nigeria of the future, that's the missing piece. So um, one of the things you said in the, where you're, you're going to talk about elected was agriculture at the primary level, I believe it's introduced at primary four. Okay, just hold your thoughts there. We'll take a moment and we'll be back to continue this conversation. Please join us again. It's good to have you here with us. We're looking at the education situation, the basic education curriculum across the country. And just before we went on that short break, um, Bassier, Mr. Bassier was talking about the question of vision, educational vision. What kind of nation are we building? What kind of people are we building? Is it uh, Nigeria of the now, or Nigeria of 2030, or Nigeria of 2050. Are we looking at a nation that's a hub for technology, for branding, or for 
what exactly are we seeing in our tomorrow? Well, let me come back to you, Adetola. That, the question of curriculum, is it possible to have each state or region develop its own curriculum? Because I think at the same time, maybe, Leo, you, you help us understand. At the same time, it looked as if some parts of the country had a curriculum that was focused on one thing and the other part were focused on the other and they were all thriving in those areas. Is it possible? It is possible to develop and drive, just like you said, having a vision towards, okay, this is what we want to do. So yes, it is possible for us to break out in whatever strengths we have and mm -hmm. focus and gear the curriculum towards that. Because like I said, you really, what curriculum is about is setting up subjects l towards learning outcomes and making sure that you are delivering meaningful and effective learning. That's what it really is in essence. So you want the students to come out and become car manufacturers. You want them to become people who develop computers. Then you start building that from the elementary school all the way to secondary school. By the time they're in, we, well, actually high we won't even call it a high institution. Uh -huh. Let's just be general. Uh -huh. They'll be prepared. They'll be ready. So yes, it is possible to break out. But the issue is. <laughs> Are we beginning to talk and engage in conversations around that? Mm -hmm. I think it really comes down to, I know we say it comes to the national level, but it also comes down to us as a people. We have to decide, do we want this? Is this important enough to us? Are we thinking about what's going to happen to our children? Our children are no longer just competing here in silos in Nigeria alone. They are competing against people across the world because the future now is freelance and it means you're no longer sitting down in an office working by yourself. You're working with people all across the world. Sometimes you're working in this gig by yourself. In fact, I call it the gig economy, and I know a lot of people term that. I was at a conference in Europe, in Germany, and that's what we're talking about, that the economy now, the future, is the gig economy, which means you're doing this short amount of work, and then this is what you're supposed to execute, then you finish, and then you move to another one. They're going to be competing with people all across the world doing this virtually on the computers, on their phones, so we have to start equipping them for that. That's the future of work. Now, let me stay with you, Aditala. Um, we often hear that uh, our graduates are unemployable, not because they're not knowledgeable, but because their knowledge is not relevant to the, the requirements of the job market. What is happening regarding that? Are we changing our curriculum to suit the needs of the market so that when these kids get out of school, they can easily get jobs? That's why I said there are three types of curriculum, subject, learner, and problem-based. We need to shift from being subject-based to being more about the learners and eventually problems. Because really what the whole world is geared around now is geared around problem solving. What, may, what, what excites us so much about uh, Tesla, the electric cars, mm. they solve the problem. Instead of us worrying about fuel for our cars, mm. we can just easily charge them and plug them and go. <laughs> so our children need to be geared in our classrooms to start thinking that way. And that's, in fact, if we're talking about curriculum, remember I mentioned the six C's, that's one of the things we're not doing. We're not raising critical thinkers, we're not raising creative thinkers. And he mentioned something which was one of the C's, constant learning. We need to also teach them that, look, you finish school, it's really not finishing the way we were taught it's finishing. You're constantly upgrading yourself, you're constantly learning. learning. I'm sure he agrees with me on this. A lot of the learning that takes place nowadays is online, either by YouTube or these courses from these universities all over the world. You go there, you brush up on skills, you read. Even when you're reading your books, you're upgrading yourself. So we need to start infusing and imbibing our children with this. That's why they're not able to cope. That's why you're seeing these our graduates frailing and not being able to adjust. Mm. And unfortunately, what happens is a lot of these organizations, um, quote unquote, multinationals, they go and export people to come here to import. do jobs. Oh, import, sorry, <laughs> export is out. <laughs> export, import, yeah. They go and import people to come in here and now take job well i should not <laughs> do jobs <laughs> take, do jobs um, that our graduates should be able to do yeah. so the key thing now is how are we going to make sure that we equip our children with those skills so that they are able to do mm. those jobs carry out those jobs mm. and and you spoke about the vision of where we want to be maybe 2030 maybe 2050 um, maybe you can give us some suggestions regarding that vision because I readily think about India, 
And I recall that all the CEOs of all the big IT companies in the world, they're all Indians from the Institute of Technology in India. Mm. I mean, what kind of advice would you give that, so that we will narrow down our vision and focus on it? I think um, there are many parts of the, the equation, but uh, perhaps I start with maintaining the integrity of this geographical piece called Nigeria. And that means that we must celebrate our diversity and we must see our diversity as a very strong um, advantage rather than a, as a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I bring that to the curriculum, in the curriculum we have promoted only three Nigerian languages. But we forget that a larger part of the country are made up of minorities in the south, in northern parts of the country, and we are not helping them imbibe their mother tongue. So we're not being inclusive. Mm -hmm. So in the Nigeria of the future, we need to encourage people to, to identify their mother tongue, identify their local, their local identity, but still remain Nigerian. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that should come through the curriculum from early years through primary education. The second thing is agriculture. Agriculture, we make so much noise about agriculture, but when you look at the curriculum, we are training people how to plant, plantain, yam and beans but we're not giving people the knowledge about becoming agripreneurs people who become you know with the mindset of let's solve our food security issues let's let's start to build competitive advantage in certain areas technology also is the, the research coming out shows that we have the scale for technology in this country and that's another place that um, we could develop um, uh, key continents. So it's, in, in summary, one is peace and diversity and, and just being confident as Nigerians and knowing our culture and our history. The second is now looking at streams of potential income where we could grow industries of the future. She's mentioned the gig economy that will be largely around technology. Logistics is a huge issue and um, this country sits in a very vital strategic position to serve sub-Saharan, um, the West African market. So of course the knowledge of French is important if you are really going to break into those key markets um, right from here um, through Cotonou um, down to Dakar. So those are things we need to take into cognizance. Um, again, you look at a lot of our people are traveling to China to do business. Do they have a knowledge of Mandarin? Do we think Mandarin should be in our curriculum? So. We, we need to look at things in that totality and not just copy a UK or American curriculum, but look at what will work and what will make Nigeria um, valid as a nation in 2030 and 2050. On the other hand, you have a lot of people in the nomadic communities, the, the pastoralists, the fishermen, the migrant fisher folk, and the migrant farmers. And under the uh, SDG goals, we shouldn't leave them behind. How does our curriculum um, harness those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Those are things that enable us to create a proper visioning um, for educational um, um, roadmap. Okay. You wanted to add something? Yes, I wanted to add that while we're on that, one of the things that we're envisioning when we created this team, and he's a part of our team, our innovation, education innovation team, was making sure, just like you said, we don't leave any children behind and creating a Nigeria that we all are excited and reverent about like, wow, this is fantastic. And solving our own problems here. To me, that's endemic of everything else. We can't keep importing people to come here to say, oh, how do we do this? How do we fix this road? How do we solve our healthcare crisis? Let's empower our children, equip our children here with the skills to solve these problems here. You'll be shocked what they are able to do, even at some very oh, tender yes. ages. They are able yes. to deal with some major problems. But the, the thing is, in terms of the content of our curriculum, um, when I went to the university, I was told by my HOD at that time that in the University of Nigeria at that time, before, okay, two sessions ago we came in. That was when the curriculum was changed. He said, you do. 40 minutes of classwork, you spend one hour practicals on that which you did. You do, four, and this is a social science department, mm -hmm. so you do 40 minutes, mm -hmm. spend one hour practicals. You do 40 minutes, you spend one hour. So it's ingrained in you. But then it was changed and was now taken to another level. So it was now a national 
curriculum and we had to follow it through. That's why I asked the question about, is it possible to break it down? But the content. So in the, in the content of what we're in the curriculum we have now, mm -hmm. you hear certain terms that our children may not be able to relate with. Some things about sexual education, some terms that are used there. How do you get our children to buy into this? Are these the things they should be learning now or should they be looking at innovation? Innovation simply is, what I, people always think when they hear the word it's innovation, tech. oh, it's something tech and it's something mm. new. Actually, innovation is just doing things differently. So this is how we've been teaching our children. Yes, I just got a perfect example in my mind. We're so used to every year uh, they bring out, give the children this textbook, and then the next year we take the textbook from them another one. Why do we have to do that? Why are we still having our children carry around these heavy textbooks when majority of them now are holding these phones? We can put them on e-books, and e-books are easier for you to adjust and say, okay, there's a new edition, let's just change this. Oh, then you having to take that old book and it becomes redundant and then throw it away. I, as, a, as an educator and as a parent, just thinking of all those wasted books, it irks me, you know, because I'm like, oh my God, all that knowledge, you know. So imagine if it was on the phones or tablets, just quickly update them, they review them, and they utilize them. Um, you know, my son said something to me the other day about how he was so excited that now in the English class, instead of them focusing on writing notes, it's more interactive because they're using the interactive board and the teacher is engaging them. They are coming up to the board, they're using it, they're going over the notes, they're reviewing. I'm like, yes, that's what it's really about. It's not about writing all those notes and flipping through those notes. It's about the student actually having a robust conversation about what they're learning and engaging with it. That's when education, that's when learning becomes effective. And I'm like, yes, that's what we want to hear more of. That's what we want to see more of. Okay, but what, what about the content that they are engaging with? Is that not a problem? The content they're engaging with, it needs work. Well, we all agree on that. And this is where what he said, I also work with teachers, I train teachers. Once we build the competency levels of our teachers, oh my goodness, a lot of things will really change. Mm. <laughs> no, no, can I just hit on something so that the audience don't, you know, I think the, the, the scenario she painted is very apt, but it's very reflective of urban private schools. So um, when we say innovation, I think that works well, but you need to always localize innovation. So in the village, in the rural areas mm. where they don't have tablets and phones, mm. there are other types of innovation that could come in handy. And um, for instance, you have where, um, if, again, both on the competence of the teacher, activity-based learning, using yes, simple things in simple your locality yes. to teach. You can use oranges yes. and bananas. You can use sticks and, um, um, what do you call it? Um, the bottle tops. The bottle, bottle, top. bottle, yeah. top, yes. bottle tops yes. to teach basic arithmetic. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah. innovation doesn't always need to evolve Fancy. a tablet, mm -hmm. a handset, mm -hmm. because there's a dichotomy in our education sector. We've got the private schools yeah. and we've got the public schools. education yes. sector. And we also have the rural versus urban divide that when you go to the villages, it's there is a lot of resource constraints. But if, if, if our teachers uh, uh, the skill sets are developed, they can still work within the parameters of whatever they have to, to really upscale uh, and ensure learning outcomes are achieved. Um, and before you come to my question, you also asked about um, if curriculums could be um, somewhat localized. localized. Um, curriculum should um, be learner focused, so in that context can be localized. But we always are tracking national competitiveness and results and assessments. So if we depart from a national curriculum, say in Cross River State or in Bornu State, then when you come to do common entrance or your key checkpoints at GS, GSS and SS3, there'll be a lot of regional variations. And for that reason, we sort of must still have a national framework. Mm -hmm. And in the context of national policy of education in Nigeria, the federal government is responsible for that policy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, um, there's a contribution from uh, Guaman Dalong, and he says we need to emphasize less on speaking good English and focus more on making our languages more functional. Note that making a beautiful suit or coupling the most exotic car, crafting the most beautiful furniture has nothing to do with English language or grammar. We must find a way to henceforth make our languages instruments of functional education rather than languages of gossip. Um, what I'm writing here, 
ask the Chinese, he says, the Igbos have achieved success in this enormously. He has a point. But, <laughs> but, mm -hmm point is most of these exams still have to be written in English. Communication, that's what I was going to say. Communication <laughs> is one of the critical skills for the 21st century. So yeah. whether you like it or not, you must communicate in the lingua franca, the common lingua franca. Yes. And whether we like to accept it or not, across the world, English is the most commonly spoken language. So I have an idea. I think every Nigerian should speak good English. I think it's important because it you want to compete favorably internationally. Mm -hmm. I think we should encourage us to have a good um, modicum of the French language because yes. we're bordered by French, French neighbors. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we, if we want to control or do business in this Equas region, French is important. I think that um, it's important to learn not just one of the three Nigerian languages. I think we should also encourage people from the three major groups to learn, pick up one language. minority language, mm -hmm. or at least catch phrases. So um, you go to South Africa, you see people that speak out of their 11 national languages, people speak seven. So I don't see why Nigerians cannot be encouraged to, to develop their mother tongue and at least learn one other language. So if, if I'm Hausa, I learn Hausa, mm -hmm. but then I pick maybe Idoma. If I'm ethic, which I am, I learn my ethic word, but then pick Yoruba. What languages does? It brings, it builds diversity. It builds the linkages. So um, we should really understand why are we learning a language? What's the purpose for it? It's mm. to communicate and it's to foster um, that connectivity. That if you get to meet anybody whose language you speak, even if it's just a couple Affinity. of words, there's that. That's yeah. why cohesiveness. Yeah. Cohesiveness. Yeah. 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 That's what I was thinking when he was talking. Yeah. Cohesiveness. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So in, in uh, building a united Nigeria, we need to get back to the language. Yes, language. Even yes. though we all speak language. English. Yeah. Yeah. But see this one. Um, Victor Igbuji says, private teachers in Nigeria, especially in Abuja, where I work, are under the minimum, are not under the minimum wage. Some earn as low as 15,000 naira. Ouch. And how would that teacher be encouraged to impart knowledge? Best. Especially mm. when the teacher knows that that child pays as much as 200,000 naira a term. Mm. Oh, God. So, no, I'm, I'm using, uh, I'm, uh, just let's yeah. use mm -hmm. the barest minimum. Some even pay as low as. 170,000 yeah, yeah. in mm -hmm. Abuja, mm -hmm. using Abuja, okay. as a, since uh, Victor is writing from Abuja. But if a teacher knows that child's paying that much, and he or she is getting, without the necessary equipment to teach, he or yeah. she gets 15,000 at the end of the month, how wow. would that teacher be encouraged to? This is why one of the things that we're talking about in our team is getting the public to buy in to what we're doing. These parents need to buy in and also push that policy needs to change about how teacher, teacher welfare is considered in Nigeria. I agree. If somebody's earning that, why would they want to put in their best? And you do want the best for your children. Think about it. When you're taking them to the hospital, you want quality care. When they're eating, do you feed them junk? You want them to eat good food. So you want the best content in their minds too. If you're, if you're only giving teachers that, they're not going to give the best content to your children. So yeah, these are things that need to be changed, and those are things we're working on. But like I said, the public also needs to join, and there needs to be an outcry about this. I, th I think um, you, what, you, what the gentleman, I think you mentioned Abuja, is, is a, pub, a private sector, um, private sector scenario. Yes. Mm. It's not dissimilar in the public education sector. In fact, um, a large chunk of the budget within the Ministry of um, Education goes towards the teacher upliftment, you know, what they, they, because the teachers get enough pay, they have what you call a TSS, welfare, welfareizer and subsidized pay given onto the teachers. So it's, it's a function of the profession. Um, and the regulator, which is Teachers Registration Council of Nigeria, is, yes. must work and we must encourage them to strengthen the professionalization of teachers so that we have different types of teacher, teachers. I mean, everyone is not a medical doctor. You have a, a professor, mm -hmm. you have a, a, someone with resident experience, and you have mm -hmm. someone who's just a house officer. And the same way, is the same thing that must happen in the teaching profession. Also, we find that because the public sector has not been able to fully cater for the needs of the citizens, the private sector has come in. Mm -hmm. And there are different types of schools in the private sector. In Lagos State, a survey was carried out with DFID, and it showed that a large population of teachers in Lagos, a larger population of teachers, were actually 
through the private education mm -hmm. system. And when we talk about private education system, don't think it's just the Granges, the Abyssinas, mm -hmm. of, of that you have had available. You have a lot of smaller, low-cost schools low -cost that are schools. providing quality mm -hmm. um, education, education, education access to good education. And it's a, a question of economies of scale. It is. You know. So we need to look at that in context of school fees, in context of the locality. Um, but in, in essence, we must build the teacher capacity. OK, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we will need to take a quick break here and come back to continue the conversation. Please join us. Good, thank you for coming, for staying with us. Uh, let's take some comments here. I am Emiola says, I think our leaders intentionally keep education budgets low, merry-go-round in strategy and implementation because if we are learned, we will ask questions. When we ask questions, it will undermine their political paths. He says our curriculum is outdated and cannot support future development. What do you say? She's revising <laughs> its sentiments of a lot of people. And like we said, I mean, yes, it does come from the top, but also we as parents, stake stakeholders, public stakeholders, should be making sure that we're building the capacity of our children in whatever forms that we can. What I mean is you're reading books to them, you're also exposing them to the best of what pertains out there. I think when you look at the budgets, particularly the education budgets, the budget of the education sector is usually the second or third largest budget but a lot of that is overheads so we have a lot of personal overheads mm -hmm. and um, under the federal ministry of education you have 52 um, agencies that sit 52. under that ministry 52 yes 52. so it's a very large agency um, with a lot of administrative overheads and it's not a function of the ministry it's a function of our civil service and until we um, so imbibe on civil service and public sector reforms. These are things that still would always um, recur okay. in our budget. Right. So it's it's a bigger issue than what people think what it is. Think yeah. It? yeah. Okay. L weigh in on this one. Victor Ariola says Nigeria is confused about going eastern or western. Easterns don't educate everybody for outward exposure. Westerns educate everybody to find their level. Either remain inward or outward. Okay. I think it's even a function of a dysfunctional um, mm. education. I like that. Yeah. Function of a dysfunctional, dysfunctional. Yeah. <laughs> When we think we must go east or west. Or west. I yeah. really respect Paul Kagame for, with all due respect, what he's done in Rwanda in, in the Rwanda. last few years mm. has been remarkable. He's not gone west, neither has he gone but east. Eastern. He's sat down to look at he's what gone Rwanda. Rwanda. Yes. And I think that's yes. what we're saying, that we're well educated. We should stop imagining that the west or east should define us we should define pick ourselves. and define what works for yes. the nigeria yeah. of now Who and the future yeah. I, it's working in rwanda and people tell yes. you rwanda is a smaller country fine is a smaller country so if you can work in rwanda then it should work in our 36 yeah, states and by default work in the larger nigeria okay yeah. all right uh, see this one here Olaolu Aleshin Aleshin Oloi, I hope I pronounced that well. <laughs> it says, I think it's important to say that total shift from primitive way of teaching to what is attainable in present day. It says, I wonder why my biology teacher would ask me to draw grasshoppers then when Chinese students were busy practicing how to create equipment and gadgets. And it says 101% emergency should be declared in the education sector. So he's talking about the, what's obtainable now. And what used what used to be that's the sad thing what's obtainable then is still what we're using a lot of time still now so those are that's what we're talking about that we need to change you i go i last week okay we're still in last week this week <laughs> this week i went to three public schools because like you said it's not enough just to go to the private schools in fact the heartbeat of what's going on you see it in the public schools and i'm still seeing our children still writing lots of notes, still talking about things that used to obtain in the 70s. And I'm thinking, why are they not talking to them about engaging their minds and questioning what they're learning? Why are they not talking about what's happening here? How do I go back? It iterates from the back, uh, backwards, sorry, backwards, forward. You know, why are they not doing things like that? Problem solving, like I mentioned earlier, because it's only from problem solving that you begin to create change. That's not happening. They are still drawing grasshoppers, like he said, mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of actually creating prototypes. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the things that I do with the social innovation enterprise that I have. 
I work on infusing and equipping our children with these skills. I talk to them about questioning, asking, making what they're learning relevant. Like, guys, you have to look around you for opportunities. Mm. You need to start thinking, because that's yeah. how you begin to see connections, you think. Mm. You know, the first impression I got when I entered university was that there was no right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. Give your answer and logically prove it. Yes. That's right. That's what I call thinking. That is mm. thinking, yes. It may be the wrong answer to the teacher, but depending on how you marshal your points and your final conclusion, it may be the right answer. That's right. It shows that you are thinking. You're thinking. Yes. And I think that, you know, you, we mentioned a lot of things here about the work environment, connectivity with the, the, um, the real sector. That's what the problem is. Um, you know, you, you're in, involved in mentoring or interviewing youth. It's, it's, it's a challenge. There's the whole absence of responsibility, accountability, and critical thinking. Mm. And that's mm. something that, you know, I keep saying the teacher is a central part of the curriculum. Um, the gentleman did mention, why is he drawing grasshoppers? If a teacher feels that you are art inclined, and by drawing grasshoppers, <laughs> you're engaging with a topic, <laughs> that is a way of implementing. So it's, it's not a one size fits all. No, it's not. You know, it's really about how, as a teacher, you are engaging your learner in that. Ad. So you find some people, you know, they're different types of learners. Some learn by drawing, yes. some learn by being left alone in the outside, <laughs> some learn in through enterprise. Yeah. So his comment yeah. about drawing is not necessarily it's he, primitive. I, I, yeah. If you look at where he's coming from, yeah. and indeed you, you, you harped on that, the fact that it's he's, or he or she's actually looking at, can we just move away from what is and look towards the future? Mm -hmm. You started that mm -hmm. when you talked about what, Vision, what kind of Nigeria yes. do we want to build. Mm -hmm. But you see, we've talked about the government. We've talked about the teachers. We've talked about policy makers. Let's come back on, in the next few minutes. Look at the role the parents. That's what I was alluding at when I was mentioning the power is us. Remember I mentioned that earlier? Yes. yes. What role can the family play in educating the child, even with Huge. the worst mm -hmm. okay. of curriculums, mm -hmm. even with the worst of teachers? Huge. Many families do not pay attention to the children's education anymore. Mm. So you want me to go ahead? Or? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> because you look like your father, mother, and father. I, I, do I do know how many, how many strokes I got with the ruler on here. <laughs> For the two times table, uh, the multiplication yeah. table. Ouch. Two times oh one, two, two, two times two, two four. <laughs> How many people do that now? Oh they are different types of parents yeah. um, in our society. We have very exposed parents. We have involved parents. We have parents who are literate. Um, I'll start backwards. So in public sector or mm -hmm. public, schools, public schools, a lot of the parents who are, if I may use the word illiterate, do not even know what their kids need, mm. you know, they're, 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 because the teachers and the school systems are not as supportive as they were 20, 40 years ago. So there's a whole divide about what does my child, they just know the children go to school and they're paying for an exam, but to what end? Are they, there are no PT engagement mm. in those typical grassroots public schools. So it's, uh, it's whatever the teacher says, whatever the school says, yeah. so the parents are not the child says and whatever the child says, the parents and the children. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, in our urban cities, we have a lot of parents that have outsourced the upbringing of their children to schools, schools and domestics in the pursuit of the preferable flea, as it were. And um, it's something that you as a parent, it shows where the value systems are, that maybe we do not, we value more of making money as opposed to a legacy. Kashula. And I think it's something mm. we need to look inwards. So the parent must play a role. I hear, even in my kids' school, I hear people always complain. There's no, there's no perfect school. People always complain. No, there's always something. The, if yeah. you go to Eton, there's always So as a parent, mm -hmm. you must realize what is the capacity of your child. What, you must help your child discover their God-given talent and where they vision for your child, where they should go to, or where they will go to the journey. And when you find that journey, you help work in a tripartite relationship with the teacher and the child to enable that child get on his journey. And that is what brings the parent-child connection. Because mm -hmm. when you leave your child out there, your child will one day become a man or woman, the connection will be there. The connection is in, dis in, is in that discovery adventure, learning together. My son's tutor um, said something to me the other day, which is extremely poignant. He was like, each day your child comes home, ask him what he learned and engage. So do, it's not just about you went to school. What did you learn in science? Yes. How did you find it? 
children want also to know and share you know, their discoveries. We need to make it magical. We need to help them and get on that journey together. And it doesn't mean that you need, to, you need to have gone to Oxford or Cambridge to do that. You can do that with a simple, basic primary six background if you really have Good. the I'm glad that you qualified that because I want to actually add that it doesn't necessarily mean that they must be literate to be able to engage with their children. Correct. I have been in uh, programs where we engage with parents and we talk to them and they were supposedly illiterate parents but they really desired the best for their children. Absolutely. And they came and they listened and they went back and they asked questions. So it really comes down to you. To me, the most important relationship is what he mentioned, the parent and child. So whenever we're talking about education, parents always remember that they are the center of it and they are the first contact for their children. They are the ones who pass on their own values, their own desires to the children. Because whether we like it or not, they have such a huge impact on the children, both negatively and positively. So like, we can call them illiterate parents, but I like to say that it has to do with the mind. You're either enlightened or you're not. It doesn't Correct. have to do whether you've read a lot or you've not read a lot. Enlightenment is your mind. What do you want? What do you desire for this child? What do you desire for this child? Lit quote unquote illiterate parents who are in the market, they ask their child, okay, what did you, what did you put do in school today now? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, what did your teacher say? They ask these questions. Mm -hmm. And they even ask questions to the parent, um, sorry, to the teachers when, whenever they are pulled into the schools. Like, oh, I went to a public school of my ward and I was listening to these market women, supposedly, asking questions about the junior WIAC exams. They, they were really curious. They weren't to really understand. And I said, see, people will just automatically dismiss them and say, oh, they are market women. I don't do that. I don't make those assumptions. I want to listen to each parent and now make assumptions. Because like you said, you do have, on the flip side, parents who are supposedly educated. I went to another school, um, a private school, and this mother who was a banker was telling me she doesn't have time to be coming there to, mm -hmm. to be listening to us go on and on about her, her children. She had two children, an older one and a younger one. And according to her, she was really upset that the younger one wasn't keeping up to par with the older one. And I told her, stop that. You can't compare two children. They have totally different brains. They have totally different mindsets. So it really comes down to you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Professor Imonoka Enakina says, reform all educational curriculum by starting from the basics, which is having one term in a season, have all stakeholders summit, implement the summit proposals and aggressively fund the education sector and provide the students with good resources. Um, when he says have one term, I really would like to understand exactly, have one term where all the stakeholders come together and you're discussing this about that in any way. We have three terms in a regular school session, right? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, we do right so now. Currently, we should have yes. one term. I, I, I don't do quite understand it's the question. Yeah, um, but I think what he's trying to say, pay more attention to the working of the curriculum, even as it is, or if you're changing it, still pay more attention yeah. to it. I think that any curriculum must be Democrat. It must be, there must be democracy, in the democratic involved. process yes. in the curriculum. And mm -hmm. this is why we're having this issue, because maybe the curriculums are developed um, without the involvement of all stakeholders. It's not just the policy makers, it should be the, t the parents, we should create a curriculum and uh, have a consultative forum kind of workshop it almost at the grassroots down. To. Maybe that's mm -hmm. what he's alluding to. Yeah. So I totally agree that we must have a, a, a working do a curriculum presented back to the Nigerians, you know, at various levels. Workshop wash, wash it right to the very bottom level. Get in input, and then it's going to be a bit more engaging. Uh, and that, I believe, is something that will, be more, that will work better. The other thing is that um, in our curriculum, I'm not sure a lot of people are aware that early years, you, you, we've been talking yes, about basic education. Yes, basic education is three, it's um, the first three years of primary, the next three years of primary, and the, uh, the last being the the three, first three years of GSS. There's also the early years, which is zero to five, and the National um, um, Council on Education has, um, it came out to the National Policy on Education in 2012, for implementation in 2014, that early years should now 
be something that is integral as part of a basic education. Mm -hmm. So hitherto it wasn't, but now it is. So now we have the nine years, but yeah. before the nine years, yeah. you have Let's the five. five years. We should get the kids. That, those three, those early years are so in instrumental to mm -hmm. the success and trajectory of a child. They are. For the following reason. For special needs, that's when you carry out the best um, interventions, interventions. And also you get the child um, school ready. And lastly, that's where you embed the local identity and the mother tongue mm. issue. So if that's really well implemented, it, it would reduce a lot of challenges on teachers in primary school. Because by the time the child is coming in primary one, there would have been sort of an identity. Maybe you're speaking Yoruba, you mm. understand who you are and where you're from. And you have special needs was already picked up and it enables a better transition point. The question... Yeah, I just wanted to add to that early years. Cognitive science has shown that that's the foundation for the brain being formed. A lot of what your, your brain matter is formed, connected. There are synapses connected at that stage, so it's really important. It's Wait, really when you talked yeah. about um, innovation, as in mm -hmm. doing something new with education, mm -hmm. um, the, okay, I asked my question, but this mm -hmm. tweet just came in here that <laughs> points to that. It said, uh, my language journey at Emogbo Jerry says, Educators try to be innovative with the topics, but are restricted by, say, exams, all this within mm. 40 minutes. Beautiful. I do know that there are some climbs where there's nothing like examination. Yes. There's just Japan, the learning and learning Finland, and all of that. Yes. How does that tie into ours where you have intermittent examinations where you need to take them? You have to be creative. As an educator, you have to be creative. As a, because I'm still an educator. As an educator, I tell them, even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes, in that 40 minutes, you bring in something that makes your students think. Either a short activity, a session where they're asking each other questions, a session where they're working together, because teamwork, collaboration, remember that was one of the six C's that I had mentioned earlier, is a huge part of the 21st century. We're not working alone. We work together. We have to work with other people. So it's really important that Yes, you have that restriction with uh, 40 minutes, but you've got to do something during that 40 minutes to make sure that you are moving our children to become progressive thinkers, that they're beginning to see things from the other perspective so they can do it. It's hard work. That's the thing. We, we need to stop staying in our comfort zone. We need to shock ourselves and do that work. Mm. Do you want to say something else? Um, I think you just kind of said it all. We just have to be, um, think out of the box. Yeah. And we need to keep localizing. Um, in being creative, if you really had a heart for the child, the people in your class to learn, you will find solutions. And the solutions don't always need a huge um, amount of money. The gentleman in the tweet, you mentioned, uh, he said something about a retreat, a term, and mm. funding. Mm. I don't think funding is a problem in Nigeria, funding <laughs> a sector. It's about knowing that we get money to the right projects. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it just becomes transactions, transactions without outcomes. So we need to ensure that whatever money is coming in actually goes to projects that to create right. mm -hmm. learning outcomes and, okay. and, and is positive outcomes for the education sector. And that good. At that point, we'll hang it there for now. We're never done talking about education. No, it never no, ends. Never done. <laughs> but thank you so much, Adetola Salau, Member Education Reformers Innovation Team. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Also, here is Andy Basieyo, who's an education specialist. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. Sunrise will be back in a moment. I just had to chip it in there. <laughs> <laughs>